So, in accordance with the Open P Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Planning Board of the Township of Franklin has been provided. If you can all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Councilman, Councilman and Barson? Here. Theodore Chase? Here. Erica Innocencio? Here. Sammy Chabon? Here. Erica, I don't think, is your mic on, Erica? Here. Thank you. Jennifer Ragno? Here. Mustafa Mansray? Charles Brown? Here. Robert Thomas? Here. Mahir Rafiq? Rebecca Hilbert and Chairman Orsini. Here. So just a few before we begin the agenda, a few administrative announcements. If you're here for any of the hearings, EWA Somerset 400, Jane Center of New Jersey, or Baldwin's Realty, they're all carried to next week, July 26th, 2023, and that'll be in the council chambers of the municipal building, not here. Um, just a little preamble for how tonight's going to go. Uh, Mr. Lieberman is going to present his witnesses. I'll give Mr. Lanfrey a chance to cross-examine those witnesses, open to the public for cross-examination of those witnesses. And then, Peter, I believe you have a planner. Um, and so we'll see how far we get. Uh, but uh, no matter what, next week's hearing is, is not going to be here, and it's not going to be on B9 if we don't finish tonight. It will be in the municipal building, and it will be those other applications I just mentioned. So with that, um, uh, minutes, the regular minutes of May 17th, 2023, if I can have a motion for those. Move to approve. Who's second? Second. Okay, me here. Thank you. Councilman and Barson? Yes. Theodore Chase. Yes. Erica, yeah, Erica Incencio. Yes. Jennifer Ragnow. Yes. Charles Brown. Oh, no, no, not Charles Brown. Robert Thomas. Yes. Mihir Rafiq. Yes. Chairman Orsini. Yes. Um, the regular minutes from June seventh, twenty twenty-three. Move to approve. Theodore Chase? Yes. Jennifer Ragnow? Yes. Charles Brown? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. Those same four people are the only ones that are allowed to vote on the next one. Uh, I'm sorry, the resolution for Summerfields? Yeah, I'm um, okay. getting to that as soon as I can get this mic to stay on for more than 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> Resolution of uh, Summerfields of Franklin, LLC. Second. Erica Incencio? Yes. Jennifer Ragnow? Yes. Charles Brown? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. And Chairman Orsini? Yes. Uh, second resolution, IDIL Davidson, LLC. Erica or Charles or Robert or Mike second. Need a second. Thanks, Charles. Erica Incencio? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Ragnow? Yes. Charles Brown? Yes. Robert Thomas? Yes. Chairman Orsini? Yes. Uh, so now we'll open the uh, meeting for general any general planning comments from the public, so I make a motion to open the meeting to any general planning comments not associated with the B9 Schoolhouse. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion carries. Uh, meeting is open to the public for any general planning comments. Seeing no takers, I move to close the public portion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
Um, no discussion items, so we'll go right to Mr. Lieberman and your witnesses. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman. Good evening, Board. Good evening, staff as well. I'm Stuart Lieberman, as you know, and I represent the Citizens Warehouse Action Group. We have three witnesses that we're going to put on tonight. Uh, Mary Pace Goldman, who is an environmental scientist, Jean Bove, who is a noise expert, and Carlos Rodriguez, who's our planner. That's our. That's what we're going to do. That's our whole case. Let me start with um, Mary. Mr. Lieberman, is, is your microphone on? Just make sure the the you'll see it turn red if it's on. I, yeah, the, you don't you don't have to. You just press it once and it turn on. Oh, and it's but, but there's, there's a side button to turn it on as well, so you might need to. Oh. Hello. Side side button first. Other side. Right. Oh. So okay. Well, it's on now. There you go. Oh, I get it. <laughs> all right. I get it now. I'm all right. You it's can fine. just repeat everything right. you said for the recording secretary. So just, right. just a reminder, Mr. Lieberman, to yourself and, and to uh, the folks you're going to have presenting, just a reminder, as you see, the, these mics are very touchy. Um, they turn off kind of randomly. So you have to kind of consistently look at the talk button down and make sure that that red, but that, that red light is on. Okay. Just continue to monitor to that because they, speak again, the they, and speak right into the mic like I am right now. All right, that's fine. I've never had anybody say they couldn't hear me in my life, so it's a new experience. But, okay, that's fine. Ma let Mary just go over here, talk in the mic, and just be careful. Oh, you have your own mic? Okay, very good. So, um, uh, what, you have to be sworn. I'll turn on my Testimony, you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes. State your full name, spell your last name, indicate by whom you're employed, and your credentials. Sure, my name is Mary. Paste Goldman, P, sure, P A I S T hyphen G O L D M A N, and I work for Rippled Waters Engineering. I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. All right, thank you. Accepted. Uh, okay, uh, 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 accepted as an expert. Is that what you meant? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Ms. Goldman, um, did you have a chance to um, review certain materials and prepare a report for, uh, for this case? Yes. Why don't you briefly describe what you, re what you reviewed, and then after you get to that point, I'm going to ask you what your conclusions are and the factual and legal basis for them. So what did you review before you did any work? Um, I reviewed all of the engineering plans, including the grading and utility plans, the drainage and stormwater report, all of the drainage area calculations, the soils and geotechnical information, the environmental permit applications, uh, the Delaware Meridian Canal Commission applications, and all of the NJDEP permit application materials. And I, there's a report dated June 24th, 2023, which was uh, submitted to this board. Is that your most recent report or was there an update on that? There was an update on that released okay. um, in July, I want to say July 10th. Okay, and, and that's your most recent report, the July 10th report. Yes. Okay, very good. Um, why don't you just t tell us um, what your conclusions are and what the factual basis is for your conclusions. Do it conclusion by conclusion, all right? Sure. I'll leave it up to you now, okay? But <laughs> to do that, thank you. I'll yeah. be gone if I'll get coffee. <laughs> All right, so I had four main um, areas of concern when reviewing the application. I wanted to start with um, the soils information. Um, in my report, I cited a bunch of different things, but one of the key uh, concerns I have is regarding the hills Carnes uh, geotechnical investigation, which stated that there was no perched water or apparent water table observed in any of the excavations or soil borings that they did. Um, because of that, uh, they are supposed to determine the groundwater table during certain time of year. There's standards in the stormwater BMP manual that require that the soil testing 
four seasonal high water table be conducted between January and April of each year. Um, the Hills Carnus testing based on the logs that were provided was done in July of 2021 and August of 2021. Um, so it's unclear to me how the determination regarding groundwater table was made by them. Um, and what really brought me to look at that in more detail was the wetland um, borings that were submitted with the DEP application noted some redoxamorphic features, which is a fancy word for indications of groundwater at shallower depths. In that report done by Du Bois Associates, um, they indicate modeling, which is Again, sort of a fancy word for like gray, it's like a chemical reaction that happens with the soil and the metal content. When it's starved of oxygen, it creates these streaks um, that are gray in color. They indicated those at a depth less than 10 inches from the surface with one to three inch pockets of groundwater observed in their logs. So I was looking for why are those different? What is the reason for the disparity between the geotechnical engineer's report and the wetland scientist's report? Um, and I think that's probably explained by the fact that the testing that was done by the geotechnical engineer was done not between January and April, but instead in July and August. So let's just slow up for a second. So you refer, you said there's something called a BMP manual that says when testing is supposed to be done? That's right. And BMP stands for what? So everybody's on the same page. Best management practices. Okay, and is that something that anyone who does this work is bound by in New Jersey? Yes, the New Jersey Stormwater Best Management Practices Manual is the standard that engineers are supposed to follow. There are certain instances where you can deviate from that, but you would need some sort of permission to do so. And who, is, was it the Hills firm, the one that did the soils work, who according to your understanding did it during the wrong time of year? Is that who did it? Yes. Okay. And so, do you have an opinion within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty as to whether that work, which was not done during the time that the best management practices says it has to be done, can be accepted as valid and uh, representative? I do not believe that should be accepted as presented because it was done in the wrong time of year. And, and, and you said that there is a way for you to get a pass and do it another time. You have to get permission, is that right? Yes, um, if the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection deems that there was a significant departure from normal conditions, they can authorize testing at an alternate time of year. Is there any evidence that DEP gave any permission of that kind here? No. Okay. So as to that issue, your opinion is that those results should not be accepted. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What other points did you want to share with the board tonight? Sure, uh, my next biggest concern with, was regarding the change to the stormwater patterns at the site. So we know that the site is bound by the scenic corridor district along Mettler's Road. We have um, a scenic corridor district overlay which outlines specific requirements for stormwater management. One of those requirements is stormwater management shall be designed to make minimal changes to natural drainage patterns and systems. Um, and with this project, um, currently stormwater runoff flows across the property towards Mettler's Road, just spreading out across the vegetation. There's really no defined channels, no defined streams. There's the pond at the south end, but there's really no other, you know, drainage features per se. With the new application, they're proposing to install a series of stormwater best management practices to collect the water, and then all of that water is piped um, to a large constructed wetland basin, um, and that single point of discharge then is directed towards Mettler's Road. So specifically, I'm concerned there with regards to the fact that they're installing such a large stormwater management basin in the scenic corridor. That basin results in an increase in stormwater volume of 1.1 million gallons under proposed conditions from the existing condition discharge. It's a class four dam, which is subject to specific standards under the New Jersey Safe Dam Act and the New, New Jersey Dam Safety Standards. Class four dams um, are required to handle rainfall from larger rain events 50% greater than a typical stormwater basin. Um, which is 12.43 inches in a 24-hour period, so a much, much more substantial amount of water 
going in that basin and being able to be handled by that basin, but with that additional capacity comes additional volume of water should there be a dam failure. Um, I've worked on a lot of dams in the state of New Jersey and frankly through the whole mid-Atlantic. Low hazard dams like this one are more prone to failure due to lack of maintenance and sort of this amorphous feeling that they're safe because they're smaller. Um, the structure itself only impounds the water um, to about five to seven feet above normal ground surface. So people think, well, it's only five feet high. It's not this massive dam like we're used to seeing with reservoirs and things of that nature. And it gives you this sort of false sense of security that if it fails, it wouldn't release a large amount of water. In this instance, this dam can hold back an additional 1 million gallons of water beyond the 1.1 million gallons of increased water that we were already talking about. I have worked on dams of similar size that have involved drownings. I've worked on dams that have had failures in just heavy rain events. Um, again, sometimes due to lack of maintenance, sometimes due to poor construction, many different reasons, but it's something to be concerned about because this is a larger structure. Okay, let's just back up then before we go on. So the first thing is, you, you did talk about the scenic corridor and you believe that there's been a change in the stormwater flow that implicates the scenic corridor ordinance. Is that correct? Yes. Very concisely explain exactly what that change is and exactly how it implicates the scenic corridor ordinance. Yes, so the stormwater flows currently all across the land. There's no pipes, there's no swales, there's no streams, there's no none of that. It's all just passing along it's the sheet land. Flows. It's sheet flows. sheet flow across the vegetation. Okay. Under the proposed conditions, everything is going into pipes, into stormwater facilities, and then into this very, very large stormwater facility, which is, meets the conditions of a dam, which has all kinds of extra implications and standards that must be complied with. But how, but by changing the stormwater flow, how does that implicate specifically the scenic corridor ordinance? That's what because I want to understand. the scenic corridor ordinance states that the stormwater management shall be designed to make minimal changes to natural drainage patterns and systems. Do you consider the change that's proposed here to be minimal? No. Why not? In, in your own words, why isn't it minimal? because we're concentrating a large volume of water into a very large structural system, which relies entirely on maintenance and upkeep to function appropriately. Okay. You also explained concerns that you uh, articulated with regard to the dam structure itself and uh, indicated there might be problems. Why should the board care about that and what fix or cure do you suggest be, uh, uh, to, to address the concern? Yeah, so I feel that it's important for you to care about it because there's a couple of things that we're missing from their application. Specifically, there's a stability analysis that's required for dams um, because of the height of the retaining walls proposed, which are 11.3 feet high in portions of this basin. Any wall over four feet in height requires a structural stability analysis to show that it's going to be able to resist overturning and other different failure points for wall systems. There wasn't any here. I do not correct? believe that was submitted. I have not seen that. If it was, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Why else should the board, besides the fact that there isn't a stability analysis, what else do you want the board to know concerning this dam? I have significant concerns just regarding the sheer volume increase of water. Um, should the dam fail? Should the, the system not function as designed? And what's downstream, which is Metler's Road and Canal Walk? What can be done about that? Um, and to address the situation appropriately, um, more detailed engineering study is required and, you know, frankly, just potentially reconfiguring the development layout and the stormwater facilities to avoid having such a large facility, I think would be, you know, what is required as per the ordinance. Okay. Do you have, thank you. Do you have any other points that you want to share with the board tonight? Yes. What are they? Um, specifically, in addition to just the retaining wall structural stability analysis not being there, um, I have concerns regarding the operation and maintenance manual. The retaining walls are not mentioned in the maintenance manual that was submitted. Um, I know the township engineer uh, requested safety ledges and ladders be added just due to the sheer size of the walls. Um, however, 
we're missing the information on the structural integrity, um, and we are also missing details on the landscaping um, that's proposed on the downstream side of that embankment. Um, again, the New Jersey Dam Safety Standards prohibit trees and shrubs with root systems being planted on dams because they have potential to cause structural failure. Um, there is a significant portion of the trees that we've been shown um, in exhibits here and what was submitted that are proposed on the dam embankment, which would require special permission from dam safety to do that. Is it a good idea? So last meeting, we saw a lot of slides of trees and that kind of thing. From your standpoint, in light of what you do for a living, is it a good idea to put the trees on top of the dam? No. Um, in fact, I routinely do inspections on dams where trees have started to grow in them, and it's always part of the maintenance that a dam owner has to do to, to take them out. They have to be removed a certain way. Permits have to be filed with the state to do the removal, um, and trees are absolutely, I've never seen trees be permitted on a dam embankment in doing this for 25 years. And you've seen no evidence that DEP's authorized it here, have you? No. Are there any other points that you want to share with the board tonight? Um, I don't think so. I feel like we've covered everything. Oh, there is one other thing. Um, the New Jersey Inland Flood Protection Rules went into effect on Monday, two days ago. Um, I recognize that at the municipal level, um, this project is not necessarily subject to those rules. Uh, it doesn't have DRCC approval yet, so it's a little unclear whether they'll be required to comply with that for DRCC. but. Um, as professionals in the industry, we've known about these rules for over a year coming out. I have proactively been working with my clients to make sure that we build our stormwater facilities to handle the increased runoff that we're already experiencing from these heavy rains. Um, in this case, the applicant did not include the new rainfall data. Right, because the new rule requires that you use more recent precipitation data than had been used in the past, right? Yes. How old was the precipitation data that had been used before this new rule, do you know? Um, I wanna say the precipitation data was from the 80s or 90s. Um, some engineers had gotten uh, more up on things and started to use more current rainfall data, but even that is pretty old. Statistically, we haven't kept up well in the engineering industry and at the state regulatory level with what's actually happening with the precipitation changes. So um, this rule uh, was considered an emergency. Um, it took a while to get adopted, um, but it's been known a long time in the industry about the changes to precipitation and the need to increase the sizes of stormwater facilities. How, how old is the data that the applicant in this case relied on when it came to precipitation? Do you know the answer? I don't. Okay, but as far as you know, is it the newest d data that's required under this new regulation? It is not. It is not. Okay. Do you have anything else that you want to share with the board tonight? I think that covers my key points. Okay, very good. So at this time, I, I don't have any more questions for this witness and uh, present him to the board for course examination. Thank present you. her to the board, excuse me. Thank you, thank you, Stuart. Um, Jen? Just a quick clarifying question. Thank you for explaining everything so well. When you talked about the um, soils and the water table testing, you talked about, in your opinion, that the testing should have been done January through April as opposed to July and August. Can you just explain to all of us why that's a more ideal testing situation? Yes. Um, so the reason why they want that tested between July, sorry, between January and April is because that's when we tend to have snow melt, like our frozen ground starts to thaw, and then we also have higher rain events. You know, that being said, it's hard to predict exactly what's going on with rain patterns in this state anymore, but historically that's considered like the rainy season that triggers the spring bloom that you see, and that's what kind of recharges our vegetation going into the spring and summer. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Mimi, I have a question. Um, in terms of your testimony about the flow of water off the site, mm -hmm. it's always been my understanding that when development happens, the there has to be a, a net reduction um, well beyond what's coming off naturally. Does the applicant comply with that net reduction? So it's a good question. Um, the way the stormwater quantity standards were written up until this rule change, um, you could use the peak flow rate reduction. So you look at 
uh, there's basically like a graph of how the rain discharge is called a hydrograph. And you look at the existing hydrographs and those discharges in cubic feet per second, and then you're required to reduce that by a certain percentage. Um, which they do, however, it still results in a net increase in volume, which is why I do have the concerns I have regarding flooding increases. So it's more that, it's not that they don't reduce it, but that the discharge, rather than going sheet flow, mm -hmm. is all directed in one place at one time right. and onto Mettler's Road. Correct. Thank you. If there's no other questions from the board, we can proceed to your... No, I have a few questions. Oh. Yep. Sorry, got to let me know. Um, can, can you just describe the implication of testing in the wrong time? Like, what, what does that actually mean that they that they tested in the wrong time? And then, if you could sort of clarify when you've seen exceptions to that rule, like, what, why would that be okay? Sure. So summertime testing tends to be drier in general, so you don't see evidence of like a high water table. Again, for the same reasons I explained to Jennifer you have this sort of seasonal recharge that occurs from the winter frost and the melt and then the heavier rain that sort of stays in the ground longer. We get like more saturated soil in general. Um, and so not testing during that season, you, testing in the summer, things can really dry out. So what that does for things like the models, those gray like streaks I was describing is they become f like lighter and harder to see. So your soil in general is like, breaks apart more easily and isn't doesn't necessarily have the same characteristics it would if it was tested in the springtime. And by missing that has the potential to change the invert elevations, the bottom elevations of the stormwater features. Because if there's actually a shallower water table, which is what I believe based on the, the wetland scientists report that they had provided, they were seeing water, you know, as shallow as ten inches and that seems consistent based on the flooding I've heard of, you know, across the street in the Canal Walk community where they have, you know, sump pumps and significant basement flooding. Um, that seasonal high water table sits much shallower and closer to the surface. So that would, again, change how they'd have to build the stormwater And, and what, what would be the implication if that were true? That, that, the, that what if it were shallower? Yeah. So they'd end up with um, groundwater in their basins. They'd have less capacity to take the stormwater runoff from their proposed development, which means that it would overflow, even though it's not designed to overflow. OK, thank you. Um, w when you said that you, in your experience, systems like this, um, I guess this sort of scale of system are more prone to failures, can you sort of give me some a more quantitative feel to that? Like, what do you mean by more? Is it just slightly more? Is it a lot more? Like, wh what do you mean by that? So it's more significant. So once you s switch up to the classification of a dam with all those extra standards, it's a class four dam. So there's three, four tiers of, of dams in the state of New Jersey. A class one dam is the really high reservoir ones that people all know are dams and have a whole bunch of crazy standards for safety, um, a class four is the lowest. Um, that is considered like a permit by rule, so it doesn't go through a DEP permit application for the dam. And because of that, it tends to have less scrutiny on the application materials that are submitted. There's less scrutiny on the maintenance. There's less inspection requirements for that size of structure. And so maintenance is always a hard thing for stormwater facilities, and then when you add in a dam like this, it's just additionally um, difficult to keep it maintained and functioning as it's supposed to. Okay, and, and and what's the implication if it doesn't work as it's intended, if it fails? Like, what do you, what happens? That sends water straight across Mettler's Road and towards Canal Walk, so you'd lose that dam embankment potentially, and all that soil and those retaining walls and all that would direct itself across the street. And because it's all being collected in that one area, as opposed to be di being dispersed, right, you're there's a significant, like, mm -hmm. I guess th the probability is what we're talking about, but the yeah. impact for sure would be higher if That's it right. were to, to break. Okay. That's right. Um, just wait for them to finish, because there's a court report, okay? So just wait. Oh. Uh, thank you, thank you. I was just instructing the witness to just wait for the uh, board member to finish the question before she responds because we have a court reporter who's going to have a nervous breakdown otherwise. <laughs> no problem. It, 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 if you were to opine as to sort of other options for design in this case, if you were the one sort of looking at this, 
where it didn't have these sort of single points of failure or whatever your cloud, cloud. Could you sort of describe what that, what your expert opinion would say would be a reasonable alternative to this? Yeah, so if I were to look at this, I think I would be looking at the building layouts, um, the parking lot layouts, and then the other stormwater features and seeing if we could maybe modify sizes of some of those so that maybe it's you know a bit more moderate size, not a bunch of small things, one large thing. I would start to try to spread it out a bit more and possibly install things in and around the buildings. I've done work on some commercial properties um, of similar scale and that it just, it's a lot of back and forth sort of iterating till you get something that really functions well to kind of keep that balance. Okay. When you spoke about the trees on the dam, uh, on the design, what, what is it about the trees? Is it that when they grow, their roots start to sort of take out at this, like, could you describe that a little bit more for me? Yes, so the root systems for certain trees, and uh, several are proposed in this um, application, um, willows and, and swamp oaks and things, they like wetter soils and they keep root systems that are shallower and these tend to send like feeder roots out closer to the surface. And so those like feeder roots have potential to go like right through the retaining wall because it's looking for a source of water. This large basin holding all that water is you know going to be a desirable spot in the summer for like a root system to come. And so that's why they don't want you to put trees on dams because of that particular issue. It creates what's called a piping failure where water can like run along the root system, create like you know, start out as like a tiny little pencil point thickness and then just keep growing, 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 and then that can actually be ultimately the source of failure. So, so is it that, that a maintenance plan would cover that if they maintained it well, or is it just that best practices don't put the trees there? Um, it's prohibited under the dam safety rules. Just prohibited. They just Unless can't you do get it. something in writing from DEP saying they'd allow it, but I've, I've never seen that in 25 years in the industry. Okay, thanks. And then um, for the precipitation data, you, you said that, that, that there's a new standard. What, what, could you just tell us a little bit more about what the difference is between the new data and the old data? Like, is it, is it significantly different? Is it just marginally different? Can you just give us a little bit of taste on that? Yeah. Uh, the new rainfall data for Somerset County um, involves a 48% increase in predicted rainfall for the 100 Oh, that's year significant. Storm. Okay. Yeah. And that was not accounted for in this application? It was not. Okay. Thank you so much. Just one quick question. Uh, could you summarize? You did mention the relationship between storm management and uh, scenic corridor, correct? Can you give me a review, a quick review of what your comment, comments were about that? How, how the plan storm management system affects the scenic corridor? Yes, yes. Um, so specifically, there's a lot of stormwater requirements in the scenic corridor um, ordinance, and the one that I feel that we're really missing is minimizing the changes to the natural drainage patterns and systems. And because everything at this site, sheet flows through vegetation isn't concentrated, and we're switching to a much more concentrated, piped, large stormwater detention basin system, we're putting massive volumes of water into a singular point where currently all that water would spread out go through vegetation, some be absorbed into the soil, um, and you, you're missing all of that with the proposed design. And how's, what's this effect on the scenic corridor? Um, so you have a lot of grading and fill in the scenic corridor and a lot of volume of stormwater being stored in the scenic corridor specifically that isn't there currently. I'm thinking in terms of, of appearance. So it's like six feet of berms proposed around that stormwater basin in order to build out the full structural um, aspect that they're proposing for that dam. So that alone is a significant volume of soil and a mound um, to keep water in the large basin that isn't there currently. So, so it's the man-made additions to it that you're objecting to? Yes. Uh, what would be your opinion then of the man-made objections to the scenic corridor on the other side of Metlers Road? The one that has a sidewalk, a curb, and all the imported landscaping which over the years has become 
very nice, can be extremely nice and not be a scenic, scenic corridor. Uh, how, how would this be any different in the other project? I feel it's different because it's specifically there to hold the stormwater and I'm going back again, like I said, to the drainage pattern shift. It's not so much to me about the vegetation, which to your point is nice and mature in the other areas. It's more so about what the purpose of that fill is, which is to hold the stormwater in that area and that change to the drainage pattern. But the other side of the street has a very large detention basin also. Yes. What's the difference other than 20 years of excellent growth on that side of the road. I mean, quite frankly, a number of people have asked me recently how that ever was designated a scenic corridor. Doesn't mean it's not nice, doesn't mean it shouldn't be protected, but again, it's got a curb, a sidewalk, and it's all man-made. Yeah, I mean, and I it, haven't... And it, its function is similar to what you described, a detention basin holding back and managing a storm a stormwater management system so I appreciate your comments I heard all the technical information that was very important I don't know that I agree with your your uh, assessment of the storm of the uh, scenic corridor okay could, could you could you read for the record the exact language that you believe is violated by this proposal as it relates to the scenic corridor just put that in the, in the sure. record. Exactly where is it, what's the citation, and exactly what is the, the citation to the section that you believe this stormwater proposal violates? Uh, I'm going to have to pull the citation, but the, the exact wording is stormwater management shall be designed to make minimal changes. No, just slow down. Oh, sure. Slow down for the court reporters. Start <laughs> over, say it again. Stormwater management shall be designed to make minimal changes to natural drainage patterns and systems. And I can pull the site. And, and that is in forward. the scenic corridor order. Yes. And so, and so do you. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep. And so, do you believe that the proposal for stormwater constitutes minimal changes as specifically uh, required in the scenic corridor ordinance? And so, that's her point. That's, that's no. her only point that I she's making. I understand all that, but yeah. I think you're missing or confusing the point. The storm manage the stormwater management and the buffering on the other side of the street violates it also. I'm concerned about the, the, the drainage, as I said, the technical aspects. Uh, neither side at some point probably is going to comply with the scenic corridor ordinance. Uh, our, our job is to make them, uh, if this is an approved project, make them uh, as nice as they can possibly be. That's what, that, that is an aesthetic thing that I'm concerned about, not the technical things that you've been talking about. And there's, there's nothing on the canal walk side of Mettler's Road that fits in with the scenic corridor ordinance. I believe that project might have predated the scenic corridor ordinance. That was actually going to be my question, is when was the approval of Canal Walk relative to the scenic corridor ordinance? Because whether or not you believe it should be a scenic corridor, it is, as it currently constructed. Right. And I don't believe that, you know, two wrongs make a right, so it doesn't mean we should violate it twice because we violated it once. Right. No, so... I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to encourage a disagreement by board members. So I don't want to be that. But but it's just I, an observation. Yeah, we so, don't. We no, don't disagree. We no, don't no, love that's fine. So I, I, it's my belief that that approval was before the scenic corridor ordinance. That's. I. We could get some more meat on that. But that's what I believe. That would be helpful because I mean Bob's point is a very valid one. Right. I'm. Not, I'm not saying that at all. But it might make a difference as to when it was because if it was already. Well, it's already developed. We'll include it in the scenic corridor just because we're including this side of the street in the scenic corridor. That might have been the rationale. Right. So uh, um, we'll, we'll work and see if I could get you a, a better answer for that question. Thank you. Right. Mr. Chairman, just uh, one question. So on the same topic, so your, your opinion is that um, since the site, obviously it's a warehouse with, with um, a, a large building and large areas of pavement. Um, they're capturing the water, piping it, and putting it into a system of basins. 
um, that's obviously changing the drainage pattern of that site. And you're saying that that's in, and there's wording in there that says you're supposed to try to maintain the, the, uh, the, the existing drainage pattern as much as you can. But there are other portions of the scenic corridor ordinance that talk about there are specific design standards for stormwater detention facilities. It talks about retention basins um, and walls and things like that. So the, the stormwater, I mean, the scenic corridor ordinance does contemplate the fact that there is going to be development that is going to have to pipe and capture, um, you know, the water. Because obviously, as you know, I don't have to tell you as an engineer, there are very detailed rules about what applicants need to do. So. Could you expand a little bit beyond, because as of right now, your testimony has been whether changing, changing the drainage pattern, and so therefore it's inconsistent. I don't think that's necessarily the whole story, because again, one, any development's gonna change the, the drainage pattern, and two, there are standards that talk about those very systems. Can you speak to that, and, and maybe to the degree that you think that the, ordin the, 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 the design is inconsistent with those design standards? Yes, um, so with regards to the basin requirements, there's detailed pieces in there about the way the vegetation is supposed to be laid out inside the basin footprint, even down to like the size of the vegetation that's supposed to be installed. Um, the applicant doesn't have all of those pieces in there, um, so they didn't attempt to fully address the vegetation standards for basins. Um, in addition, in the scenic corridor district overlay ordinance, they encourage the use of vegetated swales in an effort to minimize drainage patterns. There's no vegetated swales proposed at this site, so I would be looking at ways to reduce the amount of piping and increase the number of swales, as well as fully complying with the vegetation standards from the scenic corridor overlay ordinance. Another question, you, you were referring to, um, the st I guess there's, presumably the larger basin, I think there are three in total. Yes. Um, that's what you're classifying as a dam? Yes, uh, they actually, the applicant classified it as a dam, okay. um, and based on my review, I agree with that, that it is a class four dam. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I've seen, I, I'm not an engineer, um, I'm a planner, so I don't review those rules, um, but I know that I've looked at hundreds of site plans over the years that have uh, landscaping in and around basins. <laughs> Um, so can you explain why this application, you feel that the, 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 the applicant placing the landscaping in and around the basin is inconsistent with the rules? So in the basin is generally okay. It's outside on the berm itself where vegetation is prohibited under the dam safety standards because you'd be putting in vegetation on the down slope of that embankment and that is what creates those feeder roots that tend to cause the piping failure through the slope. So vegetating the basin in the footprint, totally acceptable, done all the time for class four structures. Vegetating outside on the embankment is not allowed under any standards that I have seen and is specifically prohibited in the dam safety standards. Do, do we have any visuals on this? I mean, like, uh, I just want to understand, like, is it like one tree, two trees? Is it a bunch of trees? Like, it's a bunch uh, how of can trees. You, can you quantify this for me? Like, how, how, how much in violation is this? Here, wait a second. Do we have I was going to say, if we pulled up like one of their landscaping well, we'll, exhibits. Just wait a second. You, you can pull up whatever you'd like. I just want to get a visual for what does we're talking help? about. This was, this was what they handed out uh, last time. We need the one with the big map. Uh, no, this is all just the drive. Those are just pictures, right, right. What do you the need? Map. I think I might have one that I printed. All right. So this doesn't take an inordinate amount of time. If you find it and refer to the marked exhibit, we can look it up afterwards. I do have, I marked it myself on, okay. on one of their plans. Because all of their exhibits from the last week yeah. we had it were marked, and if you just say it's exhibit A13 or whatever, we'll be able to go back to that. Okay, well, we what we have isn't, it's from their hard drawings, so, and, and she it didn't. It was an exhibit, but I don't know what exhibit number. Yeah, um, well, uh, let me see if there's a way we can uh, identify that. Well, if it's, if it's, not colorized, and it was, was part of, of what was submitted to yeah. us, then it wouldn't have been marked as an exhibit. No. It would have been... Just part of their well, plan. Yeah, if well, it's not a this. Photoshop or something. Why don't we mark this and just start circulate it? We have this. Yeah, that is part of their drawings that they... Okay. You want to... Mark it as Objector 1, 
Let me let me show it to Pete first. And, 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 and just also get a description, Mr. Lieberman, of what the proposed exhibit is. Okay. Well, this is 01, and I'm going well, to write 01 at the bottom. Okay. Is that what you? Okay. So we'll put 01, and uh, it is a. Uh, it's called the planting plan. The it's uh, the company appears to be the client is identified as Link Logistics. It was prepared um, by Brian Haynes, landscape It was marked Architect. as A4, folks. It, I'm told it was marked as A4. Thank so you. You, you. We might be able to just find it. Yeah. Do you want to do it that way? Yeah, let's okay. do it that way. Okay. I mean, you've marked it as O1, that's fine, and we'll refer to A4 as well. Okay. And that way that, we won't be here all night trying to figure out what we're talking about. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, the, the essence of what I'm trying to get to is, because uh, I'm trying to synthesize all the information you're telling me, that there's this funneling that's going on to a single point. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing is that there's a standard to not have trees there because that will perhaps compromise that single point. So if that's compromised, then it's a really bad outcome is what it sounds like. Because then you have 1.1 million or more gallons of water that could then stream directly onto the road and perhaps into the neighboring houses. And so the idea is how, what is the, in your expert opinion, looking at this is, is what I'm saying, an accurate reflection of a summary of what you're saying. And if you could just elaborate perhaps on the increased risk of having those, those trees or those structures there. Yes, so um, looking at the colorized exhibit that I marked up here when I was doing my review, um, I am going to estimate conservatively there's maybe 50 to 75 trees in the embankment. Um, some trees are located directly over the discharge pipe from that basin. Um, that is absolutely, I've never seen that allowed just specifically because that has potential to compromise even the pipe itself. Um, but the trees on the embankment, again, um, also all have the same potential to cause failure because it's all in the earth um, behind the retaining wall where those trees are being placed. So this is an example of where the landscaper guy and the engineer guy need, or woman need to talk to each oh, other. That's right. Okay. That's That I have seen many times before too. Okay. And so what you're saying is 50 to 75 trees look like they are not in the right place and yes. they could compromise this dam. Yes. Okay, thank you. If, in, any other questions of the board for this one? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I do. Um, just in terms, I know you've identified the dam along Metler's Road. The other two bases, would you consider those dams as well or just? Sure, there are three basins around the project. The one along Metler's, we've, we've classified as a dam, which we are in agreement with. The other two, do you classify those as dams for the record? No. Okay, and then your recommendation, just so it's clear, is to remove all trees from the embankment. Yes. Correct. All right, and I just have one last section. In terms of determining the seasonal high water table, you had mentioned that approval is needed outside of uh, January and April, but that's not my understanding. There's other methods of determining it that doesn't. So basically, I have the BMP here, section 1D, and there's two different uh, determinations. One is if it's in within January and April, then you measure directly from the soil pits. But if it's not, then you would, and let me just get this correct, during other times of the year, the depth of the seasonal high water table. Sure. During other times of the year, the depth of the seasonal high water table may be obtained from the NRSC website soil survey, provided the soil series presented at the site identify uh, based upon comparison of the profile morphology. But I don't believe that requires an outside agency approval is my question. And I just wanted to clarify from your testimony. That's, yeah, that's a great point. Um, this particular site, they claimed that the soils don't match the mapped NRCS web soil survey. So using that for the seasonal high water table when they've claimed that the soil profiles aren't inconsistent with that doesn't comply. So it would need to be tested between January and April. Do we agree with, do you agree with that? What I would say is um, we've seen a lot of other applications come before this board that have been tested outside of the January to April range. I didn't, I personally have designed this project. I don't want to speak onto whether the design engineer needed to do it, but I will leave that to their professionals. But I do believe that they've complied with the testing requirement. 
But, but the point that she's making isn't the, the time of year just per se, but it's the fact that they have rejected the sewer classifications and that they've attempted to reclassify. And what the witness is saying is in light of that, you can't rely on that alternative method. That's her point. Because here they did reject the sewer classification. It was reclassified, I agree. Yes. So I would have to get back to it. I don't want to misspeak on the record. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions for the board, and I just remind you that your, your witness will remain sworn in in case anything does come up, we can proceed to your next witness. Okay, so you don't want to have cross examination? No, we'll let cross happen all at once, just like we did with Peters. Very good. So remember, you have to. Red. Got it. All right. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, you need to get sworn in by Eric, please. Raise your right hand. Testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, God? I do. State your full name, spell your last name for the record, by whom you're employed, and your credentials. Gene Bove, B O V E. Um, I'm employed by GZA Geo Environmental out of Fairfield, New Jersey. I'm a project manager there with a, my background is environmental science with a specialty in noise and acoustics. Um, I have a New Jersey noise control officer certification and I'm also a New York City, yeah, just move the New York City DEP approved noise consultant. Okay. Um, so you're offering him uh, as a noise control noise expert. Consultant. Yes. Accepted. Um, Mr. Bo, um, Mike. Thank you, thank, thank you. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. I, I don't have to say anything. The audience reminds it's, you. No, no. <laughs> it's more confusing when you're up here. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Bove, um, good evening. You um, had an opportunity to review certain documents and then you um, offered uh, your an opinion in the form of a report. Isn't that correct? Correct. All right. Why don't you tell us uh, what documents or what what did you do in order to prepare for today? Can we? And, you, and, and what opinions do you offer and what's the factual basis for those opinions? Mr. Lieberman, yes, sir. before you go into that, can we get a proffer as to the date? of the exhibit and the author of it? The date of the report? Yes. I don't, I don't have it written. Was that? I don't have it written. I just wrote environmental impact assessment on my paperwork. What, no, he wants to know the date of your report. Oh, my report? Yes. <laughs> Isn't it right there? Isn't it? Uh, June 22nd, 2023, I believe. Okay, June, so the, the yes. report that you wrote is June 22nd. Okay, yes. Yes. so with, re and, and the opinions that you offer today are contained in that report, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so what are the opinions that you're here to offer and, and, and for each opinion, provide the factual or technical basis that supports each opinion, okay, please? Sure. Thank you. So I reviewed the environmental impact statement that was completed by the applicant. Um, I guess mine's a little simpler. Um, there was not much to review in terms of noise. Um, I believe it was on page 10. They did a very brief summary of noise. Um, in summary of that very brief section, um, it states that it is not anticipated that this facility will exceed the daytime or nighttime usage allowances for noise. Um, this statement is simply made without any backup and does not fulfill the requirements of the uh, environmental assessment ordinance for the Township of Franklin. Um, now that ordinance requires adverse environmental impacts to be looked at, um, including noise, um, it asks for project alternatives to be looked at uh, or, and mitigation measures or moralative measures to be looked at um, for noise or other uh, items that aren't noise that I don't need to discuss. Um, so in New Jersey, um, there is a noise code, um, NJAC 729 1.2 um, for commercially generated noise. Um, this noise code is at residential property lines, so even if you're generating a sound that exceeds um, the noise code on your site, if you're the commercial company, as long as it doesn't exceed that noise code at the residential property line, wherever that may be, um, then you're in compliance. So for daytime hours in New Jersey, it's 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., the uh, limit is 65 decibels. Um, nighttime hours, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m., the limit is 50 decibels. 
Um, there's also requirements for octave band levels. Um, these are Say different again. What kind octave of band levels. Okay. Um, these are just the different frequencies of noise. The center octave bands are kind of like human, human hearing. Um, there's also regulations for impulsive noises. Um, impulsive noises are a sound that lasts less than one second. Um, the limit for these during the daytime is 80 decibels um, and no more than four times in an hour. So if there's some sort of banging on your site that's one second, but it happens 30 times in an hour, it then triggers that continuous noise level of 65 that I previously discussed. Um, the Township of Franklin's administrative legislation, chapter 167, also contains noise regulations. Um, these just generally mirror the New Jersey noise code requirements. Um, I, the site plan um, that that's, um, was provided by the applicant has two proposed warehouse buildings. Um, between the two buildings, there are approximately 60 loading spaces, 95 parking spaces, two drive-in ramps. Um, as expected with a warehouse facility of this scale, uh, the following different types of sounds could be expected. Um, truck acceleration, truck deceleration, air braking, braking chirps, hitching, unhitching, backup alarms, unloading, loading of trucks, passenger vehicle horns, passenger vehicle door slams, commercial vehicle door slams, um, HVAC noises. Um, I have a couple examples of these. Where did you get that list from that you just read? Is that based on experience or where are you coming up with that That's list? That's based on experience of what you could expect of a truck at a warehouse facility. Okay. Um, now, I collected on, a pre on previous projects, we've collected noise data. Um, we had, we, I will talk about some of this more, but we had one truck in a parking lot simulate movements for us and we collected noise data with a noise meter from approximately 10 to 15 feet away. Now, reminding everyone that this is from 10 to 15 feet away, so you know wherever the property line may be, that's where the noise code is at. But I just wanted to give an example of what one, the sound levels one truck can make in the center of a site or anywhere on a site. Um, a tractor trailer idling on a driver's side, 72 decibels. Idling from the front of the truck, 75 decibels. Idling on the passenger side, 77 decibels. A slow drive-by in a parking lot, 80 decibels, air brakes, 88 decibels, air brakes in conjunction with hitching, which is a common occurrence in a warehouse, 90 decibels, um, hitching and air brakes, 94 decibels, just hitching, 90 decibels. Um, and I've got a whole list of these. I think I've gone through plenty of, of them. Um, just a reminder, those are next to the truck, not at the property line, but that's just one, one vehicle. So what is the point then? So you've indicated that there are possible noise sources at a warehouse. Yes. What do you want the board to do with that information, if anything? Yes. So um, as part of the um, environmental assessment ordinance, it requires that you look at noise. Um, no substantive backup data was given in that report regarding noise. So I would suggest that some sort of acoustic model is created. Um, to determine if there is an impact. And if there is an impact, we can then, or the applicant can then determine a mitigation. So these acoustic models, there's two generally accepted models, uh, softwares that are used. One is SoundPlan, and one is a software called Cadna A. There are a few other smaller, lesser used ones out there. Um, now the, what these do is they build a 3D model of the site. This includes the buildings, um, it includes the pavement surfaces, the grass surfaces, the trees, the nearby road, the topography, all of that. And then you go ahead and you plug in your HVAC system that creates noise and you use the um, manufacturer specifications from that to say how loud it is. You then go look at um, how many trucks per hour you're going to have on site, what type of activities they're going to do, what their typical movements on the route on the site would be. And this generates a, uh, a contour map of noise. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a, a groundwater contour map. It looks exactly like that except it's decibels. Um, and from that, you can determine what the sound levels are going to be based on the proposed actions at certain places. You could look at the property line, you could go look at somebody's house across the street, and you could also look at it at different elevations. You could ask them to do the map that shows it at 5 feet, at 10 feet, at 20 feet, so that you can get an idea of what someone's bedroom window may hear. Gee, um, the, does the local, does, does Franklin Township require any modeling as part of its environmental assessment? The word modeling is not used. So, so why should this board I impose or ask the applicant to do something that isn't literally mentioned? Can you explain your viewpoint on that? Yeah, so I, you know, I just uh, 
ran off some numbers um, that one truck can make, and people are clearly concerned that noise is an issue, and the um, Ordinance for Environmental Assessment asks that this is looked at with backup information, and it really was not. So that is my recommendation that a model is done because there's no true other way. I mean, there's some shorthand math things that could be done, but with a warehouse facility, there's a lot of moving parts, and the best way to do that is an acoustic model. The, the, the environmental impact ordinance here in Franklin specifically requires that the author of that study indicate how it got to the results, how that person got to the results it got to. Isn't that correct? Yes. As to, in terms of the noise work that was done here, was there any indication at all by the applicant as to how it reached the conclusions, what it relied on, what database it relied on, what studies, anything? No, because there, there was no noise work. It was just a few paragraphs describing how they're not going to exceed the limits. Um, and I would like to bring up an example. I worked on a project in, in Robbinsville with Stuart. Um, it was a very similar sized facility. Um, and they did a noise model. We had some issues with it. That's another discussion topic. But they determined that they were going to exceed the noise levels at a couple residential property lines. And because of that, they were able to develop mitigation, which I believe was in the form of a berm with a uh, acoustic wooden fence on top on a very small area of the property. And they re-ran the model with that mitigation, and it determined that they were not going to have any impacts which is the point of a model. You determine if there's going to be impacts without mitigation, and then you use it to help you develop your mitigation, which could be a fence, a wall, a berm. There's a lot of different possible things there. Gene, do you have anything else that you want to share with the board tonight? Uh, no. OK, oh, we're finished with this witness, so we're ready for course examination from OK, um, I guess I'll start. So just to make sure that we understand what you're really asking us to consider, is not that necessarily the applicant would exceed noise thresholds at the property line, and certainly not that even if they did, that it couldn't be mitigated. Correct. What you're saying is there's no data to support their assertion in the environmental impact statement that they don't have. Correct. We're saying two things. There isn't any, and based on real life experience, there's a possibility it could happen. Okay. That's the testimony that you got. So your recommendation is that the board would ask them to do this modeling? Or, or come up with some other basis that satisfies your ordinance requirement to support their statements. Okay. So yeah. your, your central assertion is that the claim in the environmental <clears throat> impact statement that there is no uh, detriment is not supported by any yes. data. Okay. Yes. Yes. Board question, Charles. Thank you for that. Um, you stated the decimals that were listed in your testimony were from a truck in a parking lot, correct? Yes, correct. Have you taken a look at the proposed design for this site? Yes. Do you think the noise would be louder or less uh, given the design, currently the proposed design? The numbers I provided are just on a truck in a parking lot. That has Understood. nothing to do with the design. So yes, this parking lot is internal to the buildings, but I, without seeing a model and doing some detailed analysis, there's, I, I cannot give an answer. What That's does your experience see. tell you, given that you've measured noise from trucks internal to a parking lot with buildings? Does it usually exceed or reduce, given that? It's, it's too, many, too many variables to say it. You, need a, you need a model or some, something to prove to give me numbers. I, you know, I, I can't, can't guess. All right. Yeah. Do you think the buildings at all serve as a buffer to the noise? Absolutely. Okay, so it's possible that it could reduce the noise. It is possible, but the parking lots for passenger vehicles, I believe, are, if I'm not mistaken, are not interior, and also there's HVAC on the roof. So those are also possible noise sources that are not buffered by buildings. So you are concerned that it could exceed what you've got? Yes, yes. Thank you. How does it work with noise in terms of not one truck, but two, three, four trucks. I mean, d does that, do they amplify off of each other, or is it just whatever the maximum is, it will be the maximum cost? Uh, no, so adding noise is a logarithmic equation. So at some point, a logarithmic equation. Good luck with that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if you had like a, I'm trying to think of a good way to make an example of this. If you add 65 to 65, it's going to like slightly increase. But if you added 45 to 70, it's not going to increase. It's just a logarithmic. 
can't without like doing the math. It's difficult to explain. But yeah, so it would, the more trucks, the more noise. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the basic point, right? Yeah. It, and, and it's not just the more trucks, but just the more things producing noise yes. will all work together to actually go even higher than even what one yes. maximum would be, right? That's the way the physics works. Yes, and also there's another thing these models take into account is reflectivity. So, you know, sound travels and bounces off of things. Um, so certain truck placements and building placements affect all of that and the ground. That's all, that's all part of that analysis. Right. Now, now, I know you said 15 feet. Are, are there any datas or models that do a further distance? Like, so obviously there's a standard at 15 feet, which is, I think, what you were quoting. But is there one at, like, 100 feet, for instance, what that same truck would be emanating in terms of noise? So I, that was just where I collected data. We just used that because that was an easy way to, we, we built an acoustic model with these numbers. So we were able to say, this vehicle we, is going to move in one location, two location, three locations on the site. And then you plug in the, those numbers from 10, 12, 15 feet into the model, and then it's going to calculate the distance. You're not going to go take, you don't need to go take another measurement at 100 feet from the truck, because the model's going to account for that when you plug that in. Yeah, no, I, I get the model is sort of the ideal, Yeah. right? And but. We have you, yeah. so that's why. I, yeah, yeah, understood. <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm, I'm trying to sort of suss out as much information yeah. as I can. Um, it, it could be that the board decides to to request a model, but um, in the meantime, I just want to know, like, do we do we know at all what like at a hundred feet or something? Because I'm trying to guesstimate around what the property lines would be, and it might be longer than that. But do we have any estimation of like how that sound sort of dissipates through through space? Yeah. So for ve vehicular movements, um, the standard is three decibel reduction for a doubling of distance. It's okay. also another complicated equation. But that's an easy way of saying it. So if you if these measurements say this measurement of 80 was taken at 10 feet away, right. at 20 feet that would be 77. At okay. 40 feet, it would then be 74. 74. And then you double it and take three off, and you keep doubling it and taking three off. So at off, 80 feet, sense. it would be 71? Uh, yeah, and then 160. Okay, so, so at 80 feet or 100 feet or something, we're around 70, and, and from what I understood from your testimony, at the border, it's about 50. Is that right, at nighttime? Is that what you had uh, mentioned? The nighttime regulation in New Jersey is, is 50 for continuous noise. Yes. Okay. Right. Which you might expect if there's a lot of trucks moving. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you know the the um, impulsive noises like a hitching or an air brake may become they are they have a higher regulation of 80. But if it hap like I said before, if it happens more than four times in an hour, it then defers back to that 50. All right. So, I, I hate to do this back of the napkin type of math with you, but it helps me to just understand yeah. a probability of what the likelihood of needing a study like this, and it sounds like we're actually going to be pretty close yep. to that threshold, yep. even at 100 feet, which I think might be a pretty good guesstimate. I don't know what it actually is. We could look at that. But, um, but that was helpful. As Thank long you as you so don't much. blame me for being one number off my back. Then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Can you, can you define truck for us? I'm talking case. about tractor trailers only. In, in these numbers, this the numbers I gave were a tractor trailer, and these were just examples. And this is only for on-site noise, correct? What meaning the property itself, not yes, the. I'm, yes, I'm just talking about like a 15 feet away from a truck. That was what the levels were. That is on-site, not yes. in route to the site. That is on-site, and the only time I mentioned movement was. 80 decibels for a, a pass by slowly in a parking lot. That does none of this accounts for the movements on a road. New Jersey doesn't really regulate right. truck movements on a road, which is something people should be concerned about. But there's there's no regulate no regulation there. Why didn't you recommend it though? Is there a model for that as well? There are models for that. Yes. Why wasn't that in your recommendation? Um, there's just no like regulation to like require it. It's, but, it's not in the township neither, right? But you recommended it. Yeah. So why not on the road when the noise could be even greater for the residents? That it's a concern. It could absolutely be be looked at. Um, I think if I was concerned about that model, you how would you mitigate it further down the road when you're not on your property? Okay. Which is part of why I'm not like didn't bring it up immediately. But yes, it is a it is a concern. You have a lot of 20 new trucks coming through an intersection that may be air braking in an at a at a light. Um, yeah. One way to mitigate it is to propose different routes 
to yes. and from the site, right? Yes, or I don't know if the town has ordinances on air braking or stuff like that, but those are other mitigation options there. Thanks. Yep. What, what are the sounds in the air conditioning? Uh, is it, it the air conditioning units, those HVAC units yeah. on the top? Yeah. Do, do you have an approximate of those as well? I mean, they, they vary. There's, so I, I work a lot to design residential um, buildings in New York, and we'll, we'll get units that are in the low 50s, but that's specifically designed to be quiet. Um, you could also have a big commercial building with a cooling tower that's in the 90s. It, it varies wildly. And when that, there's no, we heard um, testimony about the HVAC and that it would meet local requirements, but I'd like to see manufacturer specifications talking about our unit does X decibels. And then you can do that math to see what it would be at the property line. Okay, but but, it, but the range is fifty to ninety. Yeah, it, it varies wildly. But okay, yeah, it could be it could be more. I, I, I don't. Well, know. this is a speculative building. We don't we don't even know what's going in there. Yeah. Right? Well, so then if you built a model, say say you guys go the model route and you right. build the model, they're going to have to base that model off of something. You can then ask that that's a requirement of this, you know, that you have to put in this type or like uh, comparable. And, and then what, what would be a mitigation to the HVACs other, so is it that you would just get a different type of unit because I'm guessing that the, there's a different way to mitigate. You can't just put a burn for that, I'm guessing. Because there are, yes, sorry. Um, you could do a different type. Um, there are also um, fences people put around them. Um, there's a product called Acousta Fence where um, you may have your HVAC set up in a corner of a building. You put a chain link fence around it and it's, um, I don't know, it's maybe like a half inch, a little less thick. It's like a malleable plastic. Um, it's got acoustic ratings and you basically get zip tied to it. There's all different types of um, things that could be done. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Absolutely. Let me look down at this end of the table in case there's any questions. No? So I think uh, we're at almost 8.43 before, uh, let's just take a, a 10 minute break. I always promise Peter this, we call it the Peter pause. Um, come back at uh, 8.55 and we'll have your last witness. Okay, so we're starting again and uh, Stuart, uh, your um, third witness and then we'll go to uh, Peter for Cross and then we'll um, open it up to the public and see where we, where we stand at the end of the night. Yeah, wait one second. Oh, there. All right, well, so my next... It is on. My next witness is uh, Carlos Rodriguez. Mr. Mr. When, Mr. when Mr. Rodriguez is done silencing his phone, would you raise your right hand, please? My mic is on, folks. Uh, testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Yes. State your full name, spell your last name for the record, indicate what your credentials are and by whom you're employed. Uh, my name is Carlos Rodriguez, R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-S. I am employed by my own LLC, Design Solutions LLC. I have... It's all right, Carlos. Just put it almost right up to your mouth. You have to talk right into uh, Okay. Yeah. Practically doing oral surgery with this. <laughs> um, Let's see, I have a master's in city and regional planning from the Blaustein School at Rutgers where I also taught uh, for many years. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners, a past president of the New Jersey chapter of the American Planning Association and the editor of the fourth edition of the Complete Guide to Planning in New Jersey. The editor of the fourth edition of the Complete Guide to Planning in New Jersey. How many boards have you been recognized as an expert in New Jersey? Uh, quite a few, quite a few. Yeah, I don't think uh, uh, Do I he's accepted to? as an expert in planning. Very good, and your license is still in good order, correct? It is. Very good. Okay, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you had a chance to author a report which is dated and sealed June 15, 2023, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to do uh, tonight, please, is yes. go over the uh, essential... Would you like me to read the report? I would rather you don't read the report if you'd be so kind. And, and, the, and there might be others who have the same sort of sense. But if you'd be so kind, uh, go over the material points and explain and, and your justification or your support for them, okay? Sounds good. All right, thank you. Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to do... Um, and. 
I note that keep the mic. Keep I the note mic. that um, the the applicant did make some changes to their plans between the date when this report was issued and now. So there are some points that were made in the report that are no longer valid. I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to I just want to point that out. So the f the first thing that I'd like to do is shine a light on the size of what's being proposed here because we haven't really spent any time talking about these buildings and the size of these buildings. Now, building A is 793 feet by 193 feet. That's the equivalent of two city blocks, right? With a single building, single building, three, three, three or four stories high, also the equivalent of three football fields. That's big, very big. And building B is smaller, 425 feet by 160 feet, so it's the equivalent of one city block and one and a half football fields. So these are vast, these are vast buildings with vast floor plates that are going to require a tremendous amount of grading. That site will not be recognizable after this site plan has been implemented. Now I'd like to spend a little time talking about the purpose of this district, the B1 district. And the purpose, the stated purpose that's enumerated in section 112-8 is to provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a mixture of office, laboratory, hotel, data processing and communications, light industrial, manufacturing, and other such compatible uses which provides, op which provides opportunities for job creation. The standards for the district are intended to require maximum attention to proper site design, including the location of structures and parking areas, proper ingress and egress, architectural design, stormwater management, landscaping, and the need to ensure visual harmony and avoidance of nuisances upon adjacent residential areas. I note, as an aside, that warehousing is not an enumerated use in the intent section of this district. I also note the emphasis placed on maximum attention to site design and the need to avoid nuisances upon adjacent residential areas. Now, my theory is that what's being proposed does not fit with the intent of this, the stated intent of this district. The, and I base this on, on an analysis of the standards. Now, the minimum lot size in this district is only two acres, which is not really enough for a modern warehouse. The minimum lot front is 150 feet, front yard setback 50, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these, are, these are standards for a district that is meant to produce smaller, small scale, small footprint buildings not the monsters that we are contemplating here, right? These minimums were set so that you could have modest scale buildings that would accommodate those various uses that are permitted. Um, the flaw in this zoning, sadly, is that it doesn't impose an upper limit on what might be built in the zone, only the lower limit, so there is no maximum lot size, only a minimum lot size. Um, and, and, and there are much larger parcels. Um, but I believe that the B1 zoning and the master plan amendments leading up to it anticipated that the larger parcels would be subdivided into smaller lots 
to facilitate a range of economic development activities of a relatively modest scale. I don't think the B1 zoning anticipated that larger parcels would be developed as a whole without subdivision, therefore setting the stage for buildings with much larger footprints than intended and for activities far more intense than intended. In other words, the, my contention is that the B1 zoning did not anticipate the current uh, crop of warehouses of which B9 is, is part. Now, we have spent um, a remarkably little time we have spent a remarkably little time dealing with what we might call operational considerations namely what exactly is going to be stored in these warehouses and how will they operate and that's important because not all warehouse uses are created equal and I think this board and the public need to have sufficient information on how the use will operate in order to be able to properly evaluate its anticipated impacts on the neighbors and the community at large and devise appropriate mitigation measures as needed. We don't know literally anything about this, these warehouses. How many employees are expected to work there? How many shifts? What's the schedule? What's the maximum number of people that will be on the site at any point in time? Because the tenant or tenants have not been identified, we also don't know anything about the types of products that might be stored there. <laughs> Keeping in mind that there's a close proximity to adjacent residential uses. So will explosive, flammable, or caustic products be stored in the buildings, chemical compounds, medical waste, other good stuff. The B1 zoning places no limits on the types of goods and products that may be stored in a warehouse. And no other section of the Franklin Land Development Ordinance that I could find places limits. I think without a clear understanding of these parameters, neither the planning board nor the public can properly evaluate the future impacts or possible future impacts of the proposed facility and therefore cannot properly evaluate the consequences of the proposed application. Now, the applicant's architect did, did testify, according to my notes, at the one, the January 4, hearing that the buildings would be built as a Schedule I storage facility under the Uniform Construction Code, New Jersey edition. Storage I storage facilities are considered moderate hazard storage facilities. They're licensed to store flammable products, such as aerosol products, level one and three, bamboos and rattan, books and paper in rolls or pack, furniture, glues, lumber, upholstery, and mattresses. What is your basis for this? Where, what are you relying on? The uni a, what are you relying on and what's your basis for what you say? The Uniform Construction Code, New Jersey edition. Now, obviously, given the sensitive location of the proposed project with immediate residential neighbors in large numbers, the possible presence of unknown amounts of flammable materials is of high interest not just to the neighbors, but to the town's fire department. Um, so this is uh, what I would consider a potential public health threat. On top of the, public, the potential public health threat posed by facility-generated noise, as was testified to earlier tonight, and deteriorating air quality from vehicle emissions. Public health, I would remind everybody, is public health and safety is the number one purpose of zoning. 
So anything we do to undermine that undermines the purpose of zoning. Now, we've heard about the scenic corridor. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in my report, I describe how the scenic corridor ordinance was adopted, how it originated. It originated right here at this board. How, when it was adopted, etc. I discussed the status of the various projects on the other side of the street, some of which are not subject to the scenic corridor ordinance, some of which the others predated the ordinance. So it's, I don't think that looking at the other side of the street as a precedent applies because the, the ordinance was not in place when those uh, developments were built. Now, the applicant has eliminated some significant red flags um, in terms of the, proposed, the initial proposed cutting down of trees and massive, ex and massive extent. And now they're still cutting them down, but they're proposing to replace them. Um, and apparently, in the last version of the plan, they do. Um, although they may have to take a few off the top of the berm. So, um, but there are other aspects of the scenic core that, that are not being respected. There is a 30 foot wide driveway, I believe, still in the latest version of the plans where the, 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 the standard is 12. Now, one might say, well, maybe that standard was written for single family homes. But then, what about all the other uses that are permitted in, in this district that, that would seemingly require uh, wider driveways? Well, you can, you can get in and out of this site and make it work with a loop that's only 12 feet wide. You'd have to redesign the site, obviously. You could do a one-way system. I believe that that standard is there because every driveway opening is a breach in the scenic corridor, and the scenic corridor provisions uh, were designed to limit those breaches to, to, the, to the maximum extent possible. And so, that's a variance board that the applicant has neither has not requested and has not provided testimony to justify. That's a variance, straight and simple. So there is possibly one alternative, which I point to in my report, which is that this planning board could require the applicant to not access the site from Schoolhouse Road, but instead access the site from Jensen Drive to the east, which is an adjacent industrial property. That would take all the truck traffic off of Schoolhouse and Mettlers. And it would probably require reaching an accommodation with the adjacent property owner, but it would provide vehicular access through an existing industrial site without any additional traffic on these two roads, therefore holding the residential neighborhoods harmless. Um, a separate consideration is pedestrian and bicycle safety on both Schoolhouse Road and Medlers. In addition to the local residents that walk on these two roads for recreational purposes, my understanding is that they're also used by students at the local school. 
With the substantial increase in the presence of heavy vehicles, the safety of pedestrians and bicyclists along Medlars and Schoolhouse will be placed at increased risk. Now, your 2021 circulation plan element indicates an LTS of four for these two roads. LTS stands for level of traffic stress. It's a widely used metric. What is four compared to? That's the highest. <laughs> so is that, what does that mean? That means that cyclists using this road are at, are, are, are at the highest level of stress according to this metric already. Thank you. Already. Now that will obviously only get worse if this project is built with access from these two roads unless appropriate pedestrian and bicycle facilities capable of safeguarding the safety of pedestrians and bicycles are put in place or all of this increased truck traffic is rerouted. Okay, now further in my report, I provide you with reasons that I believe authorize you to deny without prejudice this application. Under the planning board's powers of site plan review. And I list at length language from your ordinance. For example, from section 112.183, where the very first purpose, this is the purposes of site plan review, and the very first purpose listed is preservation of existing natural resources on the site. That's not really possible when you're building a building that's 793 feet long. Purpose C is adequate screening, landscaping, and location of structures. Purpose E, efficient, safe, and aesthetic land development. Purpose F is harmonious use of land. And purpose G is compliance with appropriate design standards to ensure adequate light and air, proper building arrangement, and minimum adverse impact on surrounding property. Minimum impact on surrounding property. Now, my reading of this proposal, in, in my reading of this proposal, I don't see how it could possibly meet any one of these listed objectives. Section 112, 188 of the Land Development Ordinance deals with principles and standards for site plan and subdivision review. It states, based upon its review and the degree to which it can make positive findings, the board may approve, conditionally approve, request modifications, or deny approval of the site plan and or subdivision based on evaluation of the site plan details with respect to and at least a series of items um, to which this is referred. Uh, number one, or uh, subsection B, the environmental impact of the development relating to the preservation of existing natural resources on the site and the impact on the natural resources of the surrounding properties and neighborhood, neither of which this proposal accomplishes. <coughs> Purpose D, or subsection D, talks about the relationship of the development to adjacent uses in terms of harmonious use and design, setbacks, maintenance of property values, and negative impacts. <clears throat> now, note that nowhere in this language is it suggested that these parameters apply only when variances or other deviations are at stake. There's no 
mention of variances or other deviations. These are the principle the principles that the town's land development ordinance is instructing the planning board to use to measure whether a given site plan application should be allowed to proceed, whether or not it requires variances. This is the mandate that the town's land development ordinances places on the planning board. People frequently assume that applicants are entitled to maximize the development yield of a site. That's a false assumption. The zoning standards, such as maximum lot coverage, maximum floor area ratio, etc., establish a ceiling which can't be breached without requesting relief, but they don't establish a floor which must be attained in all circumstances. And that is where all of these various standards come to play. And as I previously mentioned, the zoning parameters for this zone reflect the minimum lot size of two acres. This property is 20 acres. The, minimum, the maximum building coverage in the B1 zone is 50%. If you applied 50% to the 20 acres, you'd end up with 435,000 square feet. So there's a mismatch here. Carlos, if you could um, look at the remainder pages and summarize the most important points, just in the interest of time. I, be a good I will. Thank I you. will. I will. I will. So, um, to summarize, um, they do need a variance, which they haven't provided any testimony in support of. They don't meet the intent, the stated intent of the zone, and they're violating all sorts of design standards that this planning board is supposed to use in evaluating a site plan. So going back to section 1112, I mean 11288 of the code, which describes the principles and standards for site plan and subdivision review, it instructs the planning board to review the site plan and or subdivision for compliance with all applicable ordinances and the master plan for harmony with surrounding uses and the overall plan for development of the township, for promotion of health, safety, order, efficiency, and economy, and for maintenance of property values and the general welfare. And based upon its review and the degree to which it can make positive findings, the board may approve, conditionally approve, request modifications, or deny approval of the site plan based on evaluation of the site plan's details. Details. So what I'm suggesting to you is that this site plan is so poor that it doesn't really pass. It doesn't pass the muster. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be given a free pass. It should be reworked completely. And there are many, many provisions in your, in your ordinance that um, authorize you to require changes or deny the application. And I'm not going to read all of them, um, although I did screen quite a bit. And you can refer to the report. But for example, section 112.188E requires the provision of a safe and efficient vehicular and pedestrian circulation system. There are no sidewalks on the site, except in front of the two car parking areas. There's no proposed sidewalk along the site's frontage, unless it showed up in the latest iteration. There are no sidewalks leading from the buildings to either two roads. There's no internal sidewalk system. 
it's hard to understand how the proposed site plan even remotely satisfies the standards in this section. Uh, we've already heard on the noise thing, um, which in my opinion has the potential to pose a very serious public health hazard. And I think that's probably all I need to put on the record for now in the interest of time. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. So I'll start. Um, can I just ask a clarification from your witness um, as to the rationale for why you think this application requires a variance? Because as it was presented, no variances were requested, especially after the site plan was modified before it ultimately got a hearing at all. So I just want to clarify for the board uh, what variance you think is required. They have, uh, they have two driveways. Correct. One is 30 feet wide, one is 24. The scenic corridor allows 12 feet wide. That's the standard. I don't think schoolhouses, the scenic corridor, though, it's Mettlers. And they don't have any driveways on Mettlers. Well, my understanding is that the entire site is encumbered by the scenic corridor provision. Now, if we did ask for a third driveway, as we have discussed, that would create a variance, but that would be a request because we've asked for like a separate car driveway. So if we made that a condition Mr. of Chairman, any approval, I, that would be. Can I clarify? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm the township planner. Um, also have a P, a PP and also AICP. And I'm also the township zoning officer. So uh, I can speak to a few things. One, I will, uh, affirm that the 12 foot driveway width does apply to schoolhouse, that the, the regulations do apply to the site as a whole. Um, however, I, I respectfully disagree with the opinion that it's a variance. The scenic corridor ordinance differentiates between zoning regulations and design standards. Section 112.201F cites a number of regulations. It talks about use, setback, building height, signage, fences and walls. And as standards under those categories, which are standard zoning regulations, and talks about how, um, how the scenic corridor ordinance, the requirements of the scenic corridor or, ordinance uh, change the otherwise applicable uh, zoning requirements or not. Uh, so for example, the setbacks. We've talked a lot about the fact that the scenic corridor ordinance doubles the required setback and also imposes standards about not allowing not just building in that setback but also any type of structure, parking lots, etc. Violation of that would be a variance because it's under that section that talks about zoning regulations. 201G is entitled design standards. And there's a whole series of things under that paragraph after paragraph that talk about site layout and stormwater design and the landscaping. Within that, it talks about site access and circulation. The 12 foot design standard is in there. And the intent of that is to try to minimize the amount of pavement that people see at the street. So that it is an intent. It is. I would say it is a, a waiver they need from that, but it's not, I don't think it rises because of the way that the ordinance is structured. In my opinion, it's not a variance. It's a design standard waiver. Right, and that's why I was trying to, thanks, Mark, and that, that's exactly what I was trying to clarify because, you know, when, when the staff examines the plan and, and says there are no variances associated with the application, and now we hear there, there is, um, that's exactly what I wanted to clarify, so thank you. Well, I, I think he has a response. To okay, that. no, no, that's fine. Yeah. Reasonable people can disagree. I mean, look, I don't know whether, it's a, whether it's a variance or a design waiver, uh, it still requires some kind of justification. Yes? Because it is a deviation and a rather drastic one. I have not heard any justification, and neither have you. What is their justification? They can redesign the site to, to satisfy that standard. 
They certainly can. I, I, I would, so when I heard the comment, frankly, I think to what end? Because if you're going to have traffic going in one way, traffic going out, you're still going to have 24 feet of pavement. So if you have one driveway of 24 feet, you know, let's, we're talking about the employee entrance, if that's 24 feet, okay, so wouldn't it make more sense to have one 24 foot wide driveway for the, for the employee entrance than two 12 foot driveways? And then, and, and, and. I mean, that could be, a, that, that's a possible compromise. You're, you need, a, you need, you can't have the 12 foot driveway provide both in and out at the same time. So yes, you could have a 12 foot loop or you could have a, a loop, a 24 foot loop. Ultimately, it, it, it ends up being the same in terms of an interruption to the scenic corridor frontage. But what you don't need is 54 feet of breach, of the, which is what you currently have proposed, 30 plus 24. So, so there's there's another there's another sort of background they need to give, and maybe that's kind of useful for for everybody in the room. So, originally before this was a B1 zone, it was all zoned M1 and M2, um, and this is what warehouses and like were all um, designed to do, and that area was all designed to accommodate those because of its proximity to 287 two separate exits on 287. As time went by and land use patterns changed and we had an active adult population that needed a great demand of housing at the turn of the century. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, 55 and over active adult communities became very popular. And so uh, what wasn't popular was, uh, with the rise of e-commerce, was strip malls and the like, hotels and things over in that specific area. And those of you who are probably, as uh, been in this township for as long as me, may remember a development called Atrium South, which was supposed to be where, um, uh, uh, currently um, off of New Brunswick, where Somerset Run currently is, which was supposed to be uh, millions of square feet of office space, which was rezoned to active adult. Fast forward to 2008, we have a subprime mortgage crash. Active adult communities, or so we were told, or led to believe, I should say, were harder to sell. People weren't moving, people were maybe staying with their kids more. But let's just say that the developers convinced the governor at the time and the state politicians at the time that they were having a tough time. So anything that was approved was then allowed to be sold as market rate. And that's where Summerfields came in. And there's a number of people who in this room, at least one, who was on the board with me at the time who fought that tooth and nail because of the impact it would have on our schools. We lost because it was taken out of our hands, out of our jurisdiction by the state. So the real intent of all of that land was to be light industrial because of its proximity. Now we have you know, the um, active adult communities and we also have, again, a, a sea change in the way we do business, which is, again, e-commerce since the pandemic. And so, just to clarify, that's how sort of land use patterns developed in this area. And so, that was the original intent. And that's why you see things like the Amazon warehouse on Weston, House Foods, et cetera. Um, that was all intended for um, large scale manufacturing. It was sod farms, it was open fields. Um, great to have been kept that way, but we know that doesn't always happen but the land use intent and pattern and the creation of the B1 zone, or the BI zone, sorry, was an, an amalgam of the M1 and M2 with enhanced design standards that Mark covered pretty well. So just, just a background on that. Questions from the board? If I might, oh, 
add a little bit to what you said. Please. Uh, yes, the, the, presently is the BI zone. Uh, previous, the BI zone was created by the merger of an M1 zone, which actually had a five acre minimum lot size, and M2 zones with a two acre, uh, and the corporate business zone, which was intended for hotels and for uh, office buildings and so forth. Uh, so the real, the point at which this lot was zoned for industrial uses would go back to 1998, really the same time that the general development plan for Canal Walk was approved, and, and long before anything in the, the nature of summer fields was before us. And the Canal Walk plan actually had a, a commercial aspect at the corner of Mettler's and Schoolhouse, in other words, across from the zone which was being created at that time as a M1 zone at that time. And actually, the creation of the M1 zone was very largely uh, driven by the second ward council person of that time, whose name was Joan Botcher, a very talkative person. Uh, and those of us on the planning board really did not want to expand the M1 zone that far west, but she was quite insistent and convinced the council. Uh, yes, with um, hindsight, it would have been nice to have a bit of residential zone, say RR3, including the two existing houses there, which are on the site under question now as a justification for some sort of buffer but you're always going to have problems when you have a border between a residential zone and an industrial zone. And I don't know what you would suggest, Mr. Rodriguez, to have in between them as a, a sufficient buffer. Um, and I might just, uh, so that's how we came to have the zoning situation that we now have. Um, the presence of houses directly across the street from the... Uh, I have a question in another direction. Uh, you mentioned Jensen Drive in your testimony. I'm sorry. You mentioned Jensen Drive. Have you uh, seen it, done any research on that, or you have any information on it? No, I have not. Well, I'll tell you, for a year I've been yelling to different people about Jensen Drive. And in a perfect world, this would probably be a solution. Uh, the problem is it takes a great deal of public and private cooperation, and neither the public or the private seem to be willing to cooperate. Jensen Drive ends, doesn't go to this property, it ends at the front of a building in front of it, I think it's Turtle and Hughes. There's a pathway down the side that would go to that property. You could go around in front of that building and go down the driveway between the other, between that building and another warehouse that has driveways that are wide enough to land an airplane on. They go directly to this property. Having that driveway extended from Jensen to this property would make this application an infinitely better application as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure, I've been told, you know, X, Y, and Z won't talk about it. Uh, there's a detention base in here, there's a detention base in there. There are some physical issues involved. I think if the, 
everybody sat together in one room and talked about it, they could all be, the physical part of it could all be worked out. And all of the traffic for these facilities would go in Heller Drive and Jensen Drive directly to the properties and out again directly to Randolph Road. But uh, I, I still have toyed in my mind throwing out a, a condition of, of, of asking people to sit down and see if this can work out. I've been told it was investigated and it can't, right? But you made a, a suggestion for a street to be used, you had no background on it. That bothers me. You didn't know, and basically I'm saying, I'm wondering if you knew what you were talking about. Uh, Secondly, are, what's your background in real estate? City planning. Well, you made <clears throat> some very good points along the way in your testimony about a lot of things, but you also mentioned the effect of this project on real estate values and what basis do you put that on? You have no expertise. Well, I'm not an appraiser, but I, I'm pretty sure that if... But that's it. You're pretty sure. I'm pretty sure, yes. <laughs> what, where's the objective part of that The objective statement? Look, if you think back to the origins of zoning, right, the very origins of zoning, why and, did and we why did we come up with a system that differentiates between land uses because be, for two reasons one was the public health consideration right you you would have a noxious land use that would locate next to a residential but I the agree, other consideration I agree which was with that. which I don't was like most the important location either but which, there's which was no most, basis for it one yeah, one, one person at a time, but please be kind to our stenographers. The other consideration, which was most important in the New York City case, was the question of real estate values. People built mansions and then they had slaughterhouses next to them. <laughs> Their real estate values tanked. That was a very, that's a historic fact. It was a very, very well documented set of circumstances. So in this case, it's not a slaughterhouse. It's to ginormous warehouses. So, so let's do this. As, as a scientist by profession, um, the thing that causes me the most angst is lack of data. We don't have that data. And I said the same thing about the environmental impact statement where um, one of Peter's witnesses made an economic statement. We had it struck from the EIS because the person had no economic background. So let's not speculate to real estate. We don't have any data. We certainly don't have any data tonight generated to support any claims. So let's let's let let's get on to the next. Thing. The last comment is I, I hope you bring it. I hope that by you bringing it up, that there could be some discussion and uh, possibilities about Jensen Drive because that throws a whole entirely different perspective on this whole project. Other board comments or questions for this particular witness? Charles. Yeah, I have a comment. I, I actually see your testimony differently. I thought it was a really powerful one. I think you've shed light on issues that have not been considered to date. Um, I also think that Jensen Drive is a key to this development in a way that would be respectful of the entirety of the neighborhood, particularly as it relates to the residential component. But you also spoke to my heart, of course, when you mentioned level four for um, bicycle and pedestrian safety on that roadway and how interaction with increased traffic, particularly <coughs> trucks, uh, could be very harmful to uh, those depending on those modes for recreational or utilitarian purposes. Um, so I'm in agreement with a lot that was shared here, and I think um, we should hear sufficient reasons why we should consider this site plan beyond what we've heard thus far. Thank you. You're, you're on the faculty of Voorhees. We've not, never met, but I recognize your name. 
I'm a pracademic. <laughs> if there's no other board questions, let's see, what time are we at? Um, Peter, uh, we'll turn it over to you for cross, and we'll see how far we get since we're 18 minutes before 10 o'clock. Where should I go? Uh, you'll just stay there, and I'll stay here. <laughs> <laughs> You want to start with me? Or give you an answer you don't necessarily uh, want to give. Yeah. 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 You want to start with me? Okay. Hopefully, I won't have to. You want to use this? Pete, use this, this bed. Okay. Who are you calling first, Mr. Lanford? Okay. She's good. I'm, I'm going to do one at a time. I'm not doing all three at the same time. It's a lawyer. <laughs> say, say. <laughs> hello, hello. All right, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, I want to go over some of the points that you made. This just pull it closer. Just, just pull it closer. There you go. Some of the points that you raised this evening. Uh, the first is that you talked about the intent of the ordinance and the intent of the zone. Can we clarify and verify that a warehouse is a permitted use on this property? Uh, it's it, no longer. No, <laughs> but, uh, at the time. It was at the time a permitted use, uh, I think, the observation that I made is that it wasn't listed. It was, it was a permitted use at the time the application was made. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. It not, that, it's not an enumerated use. It's a permitted in, use. In the intent. But it's a permitted use. Yes. Okay. And the fact that the ordinance may have changed subsequent to this application has no bearing on the board's review and decision. The board has to review this application based on the ordinance that was in effect at the time the application was submitted and deemed complete, correct? But that is the law in the state of New Jersey. So the two pages in your report concerning subsequent actions of this board or the council have no bearing at all on this application. Well, it's background information. It has no bearing on their review. Correct? They can not read it. Now, you talked about the scenic corridor. And you said the canal walk was exempt from the scenic corridor. Correct? Yes. Why? Uh, let's see. Um, <coughs> it predated the adoption of the. Microphone. It, it predated the adoption of the ordinance. What predated the adoption of the ordinance? The. The projects on the other side of the, the developments on the other side of the road, one predated the adoption of the ordinance, the other one was exempt. And there's something in my report to that effect. I'm having trouble finding it. Please try to find it. Also, Mr. Rodriguez, can you please move the mic to you? Because when you're looking down, nobody can hear you. So move the mic right under your face, please. Okay. The, the, uh, the ordinance was adopted in, I'm a reading from page 14. Thank you. Okay. Um, third paragraph. The ordinance containing the scenic corridor provisions was adopted in June of 2003 in response to an earlier recommendation from the planning board. 
The scenic corridor provisions apply to 16 roads or segments of roads, including Metler's Road. The neighboring Bayard Road townhouse development was under construction at the time and preceded the scenic corridor designation and was therefore grandfathered and not affected. The Bryant Court single family development dates back to 2018, but is exempt from the application of the scenic corridor provisions under section 112-201D1, which exempts detached one or two dwelling unit buildings. But in 2018, was there not an application for the development of 63 homes and Bryan Court as part of the Canal Walk development? I have no idea. You have no idea? Don't you think that's relevant? Not really. Not really? Why is it relevant? How is, is it relevant? Is, is Bryan Court within a thousand feet of Metler's Road? I believe so. So, shouldn't it have been subject to the scenic corridor ordinance? Uh, you're asking me to testify about something uh, about which I know absolutely nothing. So the answer is no comment. No comment. Are the homes that are on Bryant Court within the scenic corridor? I believe so. Okay. And all of those homes have a dwelling with a two-car garage? Again, how would I know? <laughs> I, I, my guess is that the answer is yes, but I didn't do an inventory of the number of garage doors in that development. Do you know the width of the driveways going leading to those garages? I didn't, I didn't measure the... the <laughs> do they exceed 12 feet? <laughs> no. I have no idea. You have no, no idea? No comment. Okay. In your report on page four, you indicate that the property in question is in planning area four. Is that correct? That's correct. Are you 100% certain of that? I looked it up. Okay. And? That was, um, I mean, I looked it up. I don't have the map with me. And planning area four is basically a rural area? It's the agricultural planning area. Yeah. And, and isn't this site serviced by water and sewer, the applicant site? I have no idea. You, you have no idea whether the applicant site will be serviced by water and sewer? What will be. Is it currently serviced? I'm thinking not. Okay. What about Canal Walk? Is that serviced by water and sewer? I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing it is, but I can't say for sure because I didn't go inquire. And if there is water and sewer available, are those properties in planning area four or planning area two? Generally speaking, their sewer is not available uh, when properties are mapped as planning area four. But, uh, you know, it's... So your report's in error, is it's not, um, it's not, it's not, it's not certain and the mapping process is a partnership between the state planning commission and the local plan and the local planning board and so there may be intentions that uh, uh, that the local planning board is trying to carry out some policy that's then reflected in the in the state plan policy map i don't know the details and the intricacies of the mapping of that property. So I can't, I can't answer that question. But, but you, you clearly stated in your report that it's in planning area four. When I looked it up on the state plan policy map, that was, that's what I saw. I mean, I could be, I could be mistaken. Is there, do you have any grounds to, to think that I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken? The I'm the one who's asking the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excuse me one second. Got 
too many papers. I assume since you referenced the Cena Carter in your report and you testified uh, to the purpose and intent of it and referenced the 16 roads that are the subject of the Cena Carter, uh, you're familiar with the ordinance. Not intimately familiar with the ordinance. Uh, just, enough, do I, do I just, enough to, just enough to opine on it, correct? Well, and the relevant, uh, the relevant aspects of it, yes. Let me, let me read, because you like to read policy statements. You referenced them in your report. To protect the township's aesthetic resources where they exist along certain designated scenic roadways as identified in the master plan. That's the purpose of the ordinance, correct? You just read it. Okay. I have to assume you read it correctly. All right. Now tell me, if I'm standing on Mr. Mr. Road. Mr. Lanford, I don't normally try to interrupt counsel's cross-examination, but for purposes of the record, that is one portion of the purpose of the scenic order. Yeah, there are, the, there are I, I, Thank you for interrupting. Uh, If you are standing on Mettler's Road and looking at the north and no, let's let's look at east and west, looking towards Canal Walk, looking towards the subject property, can you indicate what aesthetic resources are being protected in that area? I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure what, I can answer that question. What, mm -hmm. what kind of a question is that? Are you, are you calling into question the whole basis for the scenic corridor overlay zone? You're saying that, the, that this section of the road should never have been designated? I, I am asking you a question. I don't know. I didn't write the ordinance. I didn't apply it. Well, you applied it in your review. Uh, yes. So it, it's to protect aesthetics. If I'm standing on Mettler's Road, what do I see? If I'm looking at Canal Walk, what do I see? It's to protect the scenic um, features of the land. What scenic features on Canal Walk are, are protected by this ordinance? Again, <laughs> Canal, Canal Walk is, a, is an exception, isn't it? Didn't we already establish that? That was your statement. I don't know if it that's, was established. That's my contention, yes. That's so you're saying a, a 63 lot subdivision is exempt from the Cena Carter? It preceded it. Brian, court preceded well, the Cena Carter? One of, them, one of them preceded. The other is exempt because it's a single family subdivision, which is a stated exemption. Mr. Lanford, before you go on with the question, I, I'd like to ask one of the parties related to this line of questioning regarding Bryant Court. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bryant Court is part of Canal Walk, is it not? Yes. And it's the site of what was supposed to be originally a two-story commercial development, was it not? Yes. Okay. So the differentiation for purposes of board consideration is the implementation of revised plans for the site in question where the original site, at least to the testimony of the planner, I assume your planner may disagree, is that this was exempted from the scenic corridor because it predates the scenic corridor ordinance. Would you say that was correct to that point? I, I disagree with that. Well, as I said, I'll leave that to Mr. Phillips when it's his turn. Yeah, I can't answer that, but again, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did you become unplugged? Are you okay now? Okay. Yeah, I mean, 
so we, we, we in, earlier we, we already established that Stewart promised that he was going to look into the dating and all of that. Um, however, the fact of the matter is that when the overlay of the SCV zone, Senior Citizen Village, was done, it was purposely designed with a commercial feature in mind. It was clear that that commercial feature was going to comply with the scenic corridor ordinance because it was a scenic corridor, but it was designed for allowing the residents in that development to shop locally. When that same developer created a commercial use on Randolph and Schoolhouse, am I correct? Randolph and Schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. The developer asked instead to put that into a residential, which we agreed to because we didn't need to um, strip malls or commercial, uh, strip malls probably um, not the right word because they were well designed with features and, and, and design standards um, that Mark played a very big role in, I should add. Um, that, that being said, I think as your report, Mr. Rodriguez says, Bryan Court single family development dates back to 2018 but is exempt from the application of the scenic corridor provisions under section 112 201D parentheses one, which exempts detached one or two dwelling unit buildings. I don't have the memory, but that's just why that was done, but it's irrelevant, that's just fact. And it's stated in your own report that that, 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 that was exempt. So I, I think the point that in Peter is- report. No, in, in his report, yeah. it says it right on page 14. And, and, so and I, I'm just trying to say that I think the point you're trying to make is that the canal walk uh, development there is is not a, a particularly um, compliant, correct, with the scenic corridor ordinance. That being said, that's Canal Walk. What I would like to hear is what the testimony is on your property and w why you feel it. Because I mean that that's the application we're telling. Well, I, I totally get your point when it comes to Bryan Court and Canal Walk. But, but that's not the property under consideration here. Well, I, I think if you're looking at the scenic corridor, you have to look at both sides. My impression of a corridor is a, a passageway from t between two sides, and you have to look at both sides. Yeah, I'm, I'm, ba I'm basically yeah. agreeing with yeah. you, but also stating that the other fact of the matter is, is now this application concerns the other side, so and, and, I'd and, like to hear and, more about your rationale for that. And you've heard ample testimony on our compliance with that, but I will ask Mr. Rodriguez some questions concerning that. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, uh, the proposed application proposes no development within the 100-foot setback on Metlers, is that correct? Yes. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay, you also made the statement that this you don't want to overdevelop a site, and then you cited the, the zone requirements for coverages, correct? Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall making, making that particular statement, no. You, you didn't indicate that there was a 50% building coverage requirement for warehouses? For, in the zone, it's not just for warehouses, it's for everything. For everything. And, and there's also a 60% impervious coverage requirement in that zone, maximum. That's, yes. I and you I indicated so. this site is overdeveloped. Do you know what percentage of coverages my client is proposing on this site? I don't know that off the top of my head, no. You didn't hear the testimony of the engineer when he testified? I, I could barely understand what the engineer was saying. It's so garbled, well, it, it, uh, mumbled through his, his testimony, I, frankly. But I'm sure it's a number that's written on the plan somewhere, which we can look up. And I, it sounds like you know that number, so why don't you tell me what it is? The, the number is well under 50%, is it not? 
but you failed to understand the, the, the point that I was making. The point that I was making is that that coverage is, is directly correlated to the two acre site, which is the minimum lot size. <laughs> the, the coverage doesn't correlate to a five acre site or a ten acre site or it, a twenty it, acre it, site. It does, but but it's but it's uh, it's aligned. It was picked that way for with a two acre site in mind. And in an ideal world, Did, you'd have a sliding scale so that as you go from the two acre to the twenty acre, you would have something different. In, in the ideal world, but we're not in an ideal world. We're living under a Franklin Township zoning ordinance, are we not? Mr. Mr. We Thomas not? already pointed out that we're not in an ideal world. Right. So you're just agreeing and, with and, him? And my client has the right to read the ordinance and develop a site in accordance with the ordinance. It's, yes, your client should read the entire ordinance, including the extensive design standards. I understand that. And, and develop the property in accordance with those design standards. Well, it seems that, like they didn't go past the zoning and the bulk standards. That's your opinion. And never, and never bothered with the rest. And I pointed out some situations where I feel that those standards have not been complied with. You may disagree. Uh, you indicated that we didn't provide for sidewalks, correct? Yes. Did you review the revised plan and hear the testimony at the last hearing where we indicated that sidewalks were provided along schoolhouse and sidewalks were provided to the building? I was at the last meeting, but we're paying attention. Every, well, every time we every time we come here, the plan is different. You know, it's hard to keep track. How, how many changes to the plans have been made? You've made multiple changes no. to the plan over the course of the last six months. There, there were two. There was an original submission and a revised plan after the first hearing. Were there not? There was an original submission for sure. Which, which was deemed complete and in compliance with the township zoning ordinance, correct? No, well, it was deemed complete, but it was not deemed in compliance with the scenic corridor provisions. That's why you, you revised the plan <laughs> three times already, but by my count. During this, this pause in this scintillating exchange, um, <laughs> Ken, uh, we are at 10 o'clock. Um, clearly, we're not going to get a cross of, I don't know if you're going to cross their other witnesses, but let's just say for the sake of argument, uh, argument, you would. And then I know you have your planner. So now we have to talk about continuation. And uh, because, um, yeah, I think we're, we're at a good point to take a break <clears throat> and continue. So, Christine, can you just let us know when we would continue this too? And it will be, of course, here. The next available meeting that it can be continued to. Excuse me, I can't hear. Obviously. Yeah. The next available meeting that it can be continued to is September 6th at 7.30 here at Route 27 at 7.30 p.m. with no need for further notification. We will continue it then. And Mr. Okay, um, under, under Eric's guidance, I will ask for uh, a motion to continue um, September 6th, 7.30 p.m. Um, here on Route 27. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Before, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. May I, before, yep. can you gavel? Mr. Lanford? Didn't adjourn yet. Mr. Please. Mr. Lanford, it is my understanding that you intend to call Paul Phillips. Put the mic on just to. I in, intend to call him as a rebuttal witness. You intend to provide a report in a rebuttal? can't provide a report because we haven't finished cross-examining these witnesses, so we will not be providing a report. Um, I would advise the board may want to make its own determination at the September 6th meeting regarding same. Thank you. Do, 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 duly noted. Thank you. 
Also, I will grant an extension of time through the end of September if you need it. I don't have that information with me, but just to protect. We'll, we'll play it by ear and see how September 6th goes, but we'll, we'll, we'll accept that. <laughs> um, we already have a motion, and it's already passed to continue to September 6th. The motion to adjourn is Second made. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.